Sunday within the octave of the Ascension. And the Epistle, I'm going to be back here again in Minneapolis, and the Epistle was taken from that, First Epistle of St. Peter, chapter 4. Dearly beloved, be prudent and watch in prayers. But before all things, have a common mutual charity among yourselves. For charity covereth a multitude of sins, using hospitality one towards another, without murmuring, as every man hath received grace, ministering the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the words of God. If any minister, let him do it as of the power which God administereth, that in all things God may be honored through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Gospel. St. John, chapter 15. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, When the Paraclete cometh, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceedeth from the Father, he shall give testimony of me, and you shall give testimony because you are with me from the beginning. These things have I spoken to you, that you may not be scandalized. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the hour cometh, and whosoever killeth you will think that he doth a service to God. And these things they will do to you, because they know not, have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the hour shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. Thus far the words of the days, Holy God. time now just before Pentecost when the Lord given his final instructions as the, the Holy Ghost has gone is going to come in a few days on Pentecost next Sunday and then our Lord the Ascension just happened a few days ago and our Lord gave his final instructions and we have these final instructions before it went up into heaven what's going to happen to a holy church are, are made and he warns about persecution and one of the aspects of persecution he speaks about in the gospel today that they will persecute you, they will throw you out of the synagogues, they will throw you out of the churches, and then they will come and kill you, thinking they do a service to God. And why will they do these things? Because they have not known the Father nor me. And you also, also it says in the Alleluia of the Mass today, I will not leave you orphans, but I'm going to leave you, I'm warning you of what's going to happen. You're going to not see me for a little while. A little while I will go to the Father, a little while you will not see me, and again a little while you shall see me, after I return from the Father. And we see that the souls will attack the, those who hold the truth. We are holding the truth. We are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And following the saints in the last 2,000 years. And our Lord said, if you hold the truth, you will be persecuted. And those that persecute you, and throw you out of the synagogues, and kill you, will think they're doing a service to God. And why will they do this? Because they have not known the Father, nor me. Every time we go to the root cause of this persecution. And here we know that the persecution in the early ages of the church, the Diocletians of the world, the, 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 the wicked emperors of the ten great persecutions, and the pagans that have persecuted the church down the last 2,000 years, we know that they have not known the Father. They have not known Christ. And in their ignorance, they, they, they attacked and killed the followers of Christ. But we find also... Those who claim that they know Jesus Christ, those who claim that they know the truth, will throw out of the synagogues. Those who claim that they are the friends of Christ will throw you out of the synagogues. And they will persecute and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. And what is the reason? Going down to the bottom, because you have not known the Father nor me. And now we have a crisis developing in our little resistance in the battle against modernism. The great battle against modernism. And it's, where, where is, what is the root of this crisis? One of the great mistakes that laity can make, even also the priests, many priests make the same mistake, 
And they say that the crisis is because of bad bishops, because of bad priests, because of a bad pope, because of bad faithful. Now it is true that bad popes, bad bishops, and bad priests, and bad faithful lead to a great crisis. But what's the crisis? For instance, if a man comes in here who is an evil man, but he doesn't have very many muscles, and he comes in and he wants to kill. That he is an evil man is a bad thing. If he is not an evil man, there is no problem. But if he is an evil man, there is still no problem. Because if his evil stays only in himself, there is no damage done to anyone. But if the evil man comes in with a gun, and the evil man shoots everyone in the house, or the evil man blows up the house, the evil man with a gun, the evil man with bullets, the evil man with a bomb, and setting off a bomb in the house, will destroy the people in the house. Evil men, by themselves, don't accomplish evil. They must take something real, such as a gun, such as a bullet, such as a, a bomb, such as a sword, such as something which they're going to use to accomplish the evil. Therefore, our Lord says, don't feel he who can kill your body, but he who can kill your soul. Kill your body and afterwards cast your soul into eternal fire. Him you must fear. What is the one thing that kills our soul? What is the one thing that is the greatest danger to a living soul? What is the bullet that kills the Catholic? What is the bomb that blows him up? It is lies. Error. Heresy. Modernists try to limit it to only the word heresy, and only those heresies which can be clearly defined as precise heresies defined by the church. One priest told me, for instance, a traditional priest a few years ago, he said, you know, I, I don't like the new Mass. I'm never going to say the new Mass. I think the new Mass is bad. I think the new church is bad. But I can't say for sure that it's really that way. Then why not? Because a pope hasn't defined it yet. They're waiting for a pope to define it. It's something like a man who, if you have on, this, on the table, you have rat poison, on the table you have a new kind of poison no one's ever heard of, and then you have edible food. How do I know that the poison's going to kill me? Well, I have to wait until the Surgeon General report comes out. I need to wait until the doctors of the, of the American uh, uh, Medical Association have decided that this is a, to classify it as a poison, and then I might know whether I'm going to die or not. That's one way to test. The other way is eat it. If you eat the poison, you will die. The American Medical Association doesn't need to say that was designated poison. We did. You can be part of the test group. We'll take the poison and feed it to the 35 people in this room. Sure enough, 35 of them died. We'll write that down as a po evidence towards this possibly being bad for your health. But we're not sure yet because there's 150 million people in America, so we need to do more tests. And after maybe a thousand people have died, then we can say there are signs that this particular food is bad for your health. What is it that kills? Is it a decree of the American Medical Association? And what they say is bad for your health? Or is it the food itself? It's the food itself that kills. We don't need the American Medical Association to tell us that rat poison is bad for little children to eat. My little brother used to eat dog food. He's okay. <laughs> but if he eats rat poison, he won't be okay. So there is something about the dog food which is not as quite as deadly as the rat poison. What matters is, what is in the food? Now, what is food for us Catholics? What is food for human beings? Not just Catholics. Anyone that's a man. We are called rational creatures. We are rational creatures. That is, creatures that have a mind. If food is what goes into our minds, this is what makes us tick as human beings. A child can't even eat or learn to live as a human being unless his mind is filled. He has to learn what is food and what is not food. He has to use his reason to even eat. So human beings require reason. They require truth. That's our food. Therefore, the greatest harm that can ever come to a human being is a lie. Now the greatest protector of human beings is the Pope, after him the bishops, after him the priests. We are the greatest protectors of human life. 
And human life is protected by truth. Human life is destroyed by lies. We are not going to march only against abortion. Abortion kills only the body. It is not that great of a harm. But that which kills the soul destroys generations, destroys civilizations, causes cold souls to go to hell, destroys forever. If we want to defend, we must defend the truth. Now how does the devil destroy souls? Through lies. Now there's one particular lie which we thought a few years ago could never happen inside a tradition. We thought it could never happen in the mainstream society. We thought it could never happen within the resistance in the last four years. But it has happened. And this, these lies are destroying souls. And we don't need to wait for an infallible decree from the Pope. The decrees have already been given. We don't need to wait for a special uh, command from on high. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, they will kill you, they will persecute you, they will throw you out, as it says in the Gospel today. Why? Because they have not known the Father, nor me. They have not known me, who is the truth. They have not known the Father, who speaks the truth. The Father speaks the Word, and the Son is the Word. They have not known the Father, they won't listen. They have not known the Word, He is not in their hearts. He's not in their minds. And therefore, since they know not the Father to whom they do not listen, and they know not the Son who is not in their hearts, not in their mind, not in their blood, the truth, the living truth, therefore, they believe lies. And what will they do when they come into contact with truth? Whenever a lie comes into contact with truth, lie hates the truth. The liars hate the truth, and they try to destroy it. So how do we protect ourselves? Know the truth. Love the truth, listen to the truth, and let the truth enter into our minds and hearts. Now there is a lie that is presently spread, that did become familiar with us in the last nine, eleven months. Now we find the mainstream society in an unusual ploy. The mainstream society is now following the liberalism of the resistance. We thought that the danger was that the resistance would follow the liberalism of the mainstream society. But now we find the mainstream finding itself following the liberalism of a part of the resistance which says that there are miracles in the new mass. So we have here from the sspx.org on the website now. A few years ago, whenever we give a sermon about what's on the website, a few days later we disappear from the website. I don't know if that will happen this time, maybe not. But in any case, as of today, it's still on the website, the sspx.org, the miracles of the new mass, Eucharistic miracles, the latest Eucharistic miracle. New Eucharistic Miracle in Poland. A report on the most recent Eucharistic Miracle in Poland with an answer to a common objection. This miracle is a miracle of 2013. And this miracle almost looks completely identical to the miracle mentioned by Bishop Williamson in his, Paris, in his uh, uh, first liaison comments of the five on the New Mass in November of last year, where he said that there were miracles in the New Mass Miracles, uh, you know, there are miracles in the new mass, uh, points to the good, alas, in one of his little points. Mm. So there's miracles in the new mass. And he gave an example of Buenos Aires. And in Buenos Aires, there was a host that was dropped on the floor. The priest put it into a bowl of water. Several days later, when he opened up the bowl, the, the cabinet in which the, the, the post was, it had turned into a human heart. It was sent to a laboratory. 2008, in Poland, he mentions that miracle, a similar thing happened. 2013, in Poland also, now the Society of St. Pius X mentions a miracle. What happened? A host fell on the floor. The host was picked up. The host was put by the priest into a bowl of water, allowed by the rubrics. Well, the host is contaminated. He put the host in the water. He put the host in the tabernacle. A few days later, they opened it up, and it was turning into a human heart of a man who had been wounded. Same miracle. So we got a miracle in Buenos Aires, 1996, another one. In Poland, 2008, another one, 2013, in Poland also, all miracles of the new Mass. And as Bishop Williamson said about these miracles of the new Mass, we must stubborn, facts are stubborn, facts are stubborn things. And these facts indicate that there's good coming out of the new Mass. Yes, in general, the new Mass as the new religion is bad, but even then he doesn't say that. He says the new Mass, like unto the new religion, 
is ambiguous. And the trouble with ambiguity is it depends. If the good priest takes the ambiguity, he turns it to the good. And the bad priest turns it to the bad. So he says both the new mass and the new religion are ambiguous and can be used for good or ill depending upon the priest. Now the Society of Pius X follows the suit of Bishop Williamson and of, the, of this part of the resistance. And they say, well, there's miracles in the new mass, miracles in Poland. Recent miracles, which are investigated by scientists and made public by the proper ecclesiastical authority, are they not in the plan of God? And today as in the past, are they not a reminder of His real presence, a powerful apologetical argument, and an invitation to increase our faith and devotion? A powerful apologetic argument for what? Here there is a dispute. Some say it's a powerful apologetical argument that says only that there may be valid masses in the new right. And of course, where there's valid masses, well, Christ is there, so certainly there must be some grace since Christ is there. Others who have more reason to say, no, these uh, miracles indicate that, of course, the new mass is good. The new mass is a true expression of the sacrifice of Calvary, it is pleasing to our Lord Jesus Christ, and it is beneficial to souls. Therefore, these are the facts. The facts are there's miracles. How can you deny the miracles? Two priests in the resistance and Bishop Four. Talk to me about the miracles. These are a fact. There's miracles in the new mass. There's miracles in the new mass. Is it a fact? No, it is not. No, it is not at all. Just briefly, one point about this miracle, which is different from the other miracles, Eucharistic miracles. There were no witnesses of the miracle. There was a host put in water. Come back three days later, and it is changed. Is it changed, or did someone make a switch? And furthermore, why in the water? Is it water, or is it some kind of fluid that preserves tissues? Is there a hoax, or is it real? If it happens once, maybe it's real. But now we're finding the pattern, the same miracle. We got the miracle in, in Buenos Aires. The first miracle was 93, didn't work out. Second miracle was 94, 95, didn't work out. The third miracle, 96, they finally got the miracle down in the same church. The third miracle worked. The third miracle is a charm, is how the saying goes. And then so the third miracle worked. Then the bishop, Bergoglio, and the other bishop in Poland, another bishop in Poland, they say it's a miracle. Now remember, these ones who say it's a miracle, the proper ecclesiastical authority, the Pope is a proper ecclesiastical authority. The bishop is a Pope for proper ecclesiastical authority. So ask them, do you believe in the miracle of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we're not certain. Well, they believe in the miracle of this host. But they don't believe that Jesus Christ necessarily rose from the dead. Do you believe that Moses walked on dry land with 600,000 men and another million and a half women and children through the middle of the Red Sea, with a wall of water on one side and a wall of water on the other side, and he walked up the other side, and Pharaoh tried it, and it didn't work. And Pharaoh and all of his cohort were killed by that sea. And that same sea saved Moses. Do you believe that? Well, we don't know. They don't believe in the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea. They don't believe in the miracle of the resurrection. They don't believe in the miracle of the raising of Lazarus. They don't believe in the miracles contained in the Gospel. They don't believe in the miracles of the Old Testament. Obviously, these are the right experts to go to to see if this was a miracle. So, we go to the experts who do not believe in the miracles of the Gospel, who do not believe in the miracles of sacred Scripture, who don't even believe the Catholic Church is the true Church, and these are the experts. And they said, it's a miracle. Why did they say it's a miracle? Because this Miracle confirms Vatican II. Because this miracle confirms the new mass. This miracle means you can be madly in love with God and your fourth wife. <laughs> Whereas a real miracle is going to tell you you've got to dump your fourth wife. And you've got to go back to God. And you have to not live in sin anymore. The new miracle says you can have abortion and contraception. You don't have to have all those children. The old miracle says you have all the children God sends you. The old miracle confirmed ten of the ten commandments. Ten out of ten. 
The new miracle confirms 0, 0.00 out of 10. Bad number. Bad percentage. And so what is happening? These miracles are confirming souls unto damnation. They are not confirming souls unto salvation. Now, how is it causing confusion amongst our people? Well, Bishop Filet says that it can be a real miracle. And he's a man of tradition. Bishop Williamson is the man of tradition. He is the Holocaust denier. You can't be more traditional than that. <laughs> if you're a Holocaust denier, then you're the most traditional man in the world. And therefore, he is the most traditional man in the world since he's a Holocaust denier. And he says that there's miracles in the New Mass. So there must be miracles in the New Mass. And these miracles indicate that the New Mass and the New Church can do good for your souls. Now, I know the Old Mass is better. I prefer the Old Mass, but I can't be against the New Mass. What is the purpose of this lie? It is to make traditional Catholics go one step closer to hell. What does that mean? They will believe that the New Mass, while it is not quite as good as the Old Mass, essentially, it's, a good, it's good enough. It's like taking a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a cheap car and driving it, or taking a Lamborghini and driving it. You would take an expensive, good car and take it from A to B. You could take a cheap car and take it from A to B. You could take a car that barely works and a car that is in magnificent condition. But both of them will take you from A to B. So they're both essentially okay. One car might be faster. One car might be more beautiful. One car might be better. But they both get you there. But what we say is the truth. And that is, the one car is owned by Al-Qaeda and has explosives in it. Don't get in it. It's going to be an unhappy experience for you and your neighbors. Don't get in that car. That car will not get you to its destination. That car is deadly. And that car is called the Nova Sotomise, which is straight from hell. And not only that, but let's see what the church has to say about valid sacraments. Confusion is coming to souls because... They say, well, if it's valid, then Christ is there. And if Christ is there, then it must be good. Because Christ is there. I mean, if, if, a, if a schismatic priest or a heretical priest says a Latin Tridentine Mass, can you go to it? You know that the Orthodox, the schismatics, the schismatics, and the Ukrainians and the, and the Russians and so on, they say the same Mass we say. It's perfectly valid. They're real priests. They're real bishops. They're celebrating the same Mass with the same words. And if you go to it, you commit a mortal sin. But that's not all. That's not all. The fact is, grace does not flow from that Mass. Christ is really present. We have the rules of canon law. If you walk by an Orthodox church, for instance, you're in that church and you have to attend a wedding. So what do you do if you attend a wedding in an Orthodox church? You can't participate. Here's the rule of canon law. You can't participate. But since Christ is really present in the tabernacle, you can kneel down and you can genuflect. But you can't participate. If you participate, it's a sin. But you can kneel down and you can genuflect because Christ is really present in the tabernacle. It's a real Orthodox priest. Who's true, who's true, all the Orthodox are validly ordained, valid priests and valid bishops and so on. But if you participate, it's a mortal sin. It's a mortal sin. And grace does not flow from that valid mass. Here's St. Thomas Aquinas. Question 82, Article 7, the Summa Theologica Tertia Pars. And since the consecration of the Eucharist is a power which follows the power of order. Remember, I have holy orders. Holy order is a living sacrament. It lives inside of a priest. So since the consecration of the Eucharist is a power which follows the power of order, such persons as are separated from the church by heresy, schism, or excommunication, they can indeed consecrate the Eucharist. See, the argument is, if Christ is really present in a valid Mass, well, then it must be sufficiently good. Not according to St. Thomas. And St. Thomas didn't talk about the new Mass. St. Thomas was talking about the Latin Tridentine Mass celebrated by a schismatic, celebrated by a heretic, or by one who is truly and validly excommunicated can indeed consecrate the Eucharist, which on being consecrated by them contains Christ's true body and blood. But they act wrongly 
and they sin by doing so, and in consequence they do not receive the fruit of the sacrifice, which is a spiritual sacrifice. There is no fruit of the sacrifice. Christ is made present. Let's go to the example of the priest who was there and made the crucifixion possible. Caiaphas is his name. Caiaphas is a true priest, though of the Old Testament. He was the one that arranged the crucifixion of Christ. Did grace flow from Caiaphas? Do we say, Sante Caiapha ora probis? <laughs> we don't. Caiaphas arranged the crucifixion. Caiaphas was a priest, a true priest, made priest by God, even though a priest of the Old Testament. Caiaphas offered sacrifice, and they were true sacrifices of the Old Testament, and his sacrifices were bloody sacrifices. He couldn't offer an unbloody sacrifice. He was not a priest of the New Testament, but he could offer a bloody sacrifice, and he is the one who made sure the bloody sacrifice of Calvary happened. He was a priest that made sure the bloody sacrifice of Calvary happened, and through that bloody sacrifice we are saved. Was Caiaphas saved? No, he's damned. Did Caiaphas get benefit from that sacrifice? No, he did not. And of course, it wasn't a true sacrifice of Caiaphas. He was not a priest of the New Testament. It was not a true sacrifice of Caiaphas. But he was a real priest of the Old Testament, and his sacrifices were not pleasing to God. Just like Cain's sacrifice was not pleasing to God. But Cain offered a true sacrifice. Abel also offered a true sacrifice. Abel's sacrifice was pleasing. Cain's sacrifice was not. True God, true sacrifice. We go forward in time to Moses. And the sons of Korah were legitimate priests before Aaron was made a priest. But they didn't like the fact that they were no longer priests. They offered sacrifice to the true God. And they were swallowed up into hell. It was not pleasing to him. So some say, well, at least it's not a Protestant church. At least it's not a Protestant sacrifice. The new Mass is a Protestant sacrifice. The old Mass, the old Mass said in union with the conciliar church or the old mass which is a which is a systematic church the new mass being the old mass being said in communion with the orthodox church the old mass being said separated from the true church is not pleasing to god the fruit of the sacrifice does not happen question 82 of saint thomas aquinas also further on in the same article <clears throat> consequently a priest who is severed from the unity of the church celebrates mass so it's a true mass. Not having lost the power of order, he consecrated Christ's true body and blood. But because he is severed from the unity of the church, his prayers have no efficacy. You want to read about holy prayers? Wisdom chapter 4. We quote it often. Beautiful prayers. The only problem is they're the prayers of the damned. We fools, we estimated their life as madness. Behold how they are in glory, and we are condemned, and they're sorry. They're so sorry. Are they forgiven? No. Jeremiah, God tells Jeremiah, pray not for this people. I will not hear thee. So man can pray, and God can decide to not hear. Pray not for the damned. I will not hear thee. And the damned pray. They pray to cease to exist. They will never cease to exist. They pray that their sufferings come to an end. It shall never come to an end. They wish that they can have eternal happiness. And this is a prayer. And they will never have it. And they will pray to the true God whom they hate. And they will never have Him. So, there are no liars in hell. They all speak truth down there. There are no lies in heaven. Lies are only on this earth. And they don't last. And they don't last. Those who believe lies end up in the true place called hell. Those who reject the lies and live according to that rejection of the lies, they end up in the true place called heaven. There are not miracles in the new mess. God could not confirm these miracles. Now, Capello, a theologian before Vatican II, a Jesuit, and his Rocavis Canonico Morales, De Sacramentis. Priests who are separated from the church Although they validly sacrifice in the name of Christ, and we're assuming they're saying the true Mass, the same thing over and over again. They validly sacrifice in the name of Christ, so it's true Mass, true priesthood, okay, no problem. Nevertheless, they do not offer the sacrifice as ministers of the church. They're not offering as ministers of the church. Here we can point out, Father Hess explains quite well, 
Watch again his explanation of the new ordination rite. New, new mass. He says correctly, they are schismatic rites. So let's say that they might be valid. The new mass might be valid. The new ordination rite is most likely valid. The new mass, doubtfully valid. But even if they are valid, guess what? They are schismatic. They are displeasing to God. They are sacrilegious. And you can even see the difference with your own eyes. When you see a traditional priest, and when you see a Novus Ordo priest, you can tell the difference. They're different. They might be vowed, they ordained, but they belong to another rite. They belong to a rite that is not of God. It is a schismatic rite. It is not pleasing to God, and therefore they are, in strictly speaking, schismatics. They are schismatics. Inside of their hearts they may not be, but objectively, externally they are. They are in a schismatic rite. And when they unite their hearts to the modernist teaching of the church, they become schismatics. And if they don't unite their hearts to it, they may not be personally schismatics. But they're definitely participating in a schismatic rite, which is displeasing to God. What is the rule about a schismatic rite? Assuming that it could even be valid, the new mass, forget it, it's, it's garbage. It's displeasing to God, and it's in its own nature. It can never be pleasing to God. No matter how holy the priest that says it, it can never be pleasing to God. Never. The old mass can be pleasing to God, on the condition that the priest who celebrates it is in true union with the church. That's why it matters whether we say, Unicum Papa Nostro Francisco during the canon. You can't hear that. Even if you're a server of an MC at mass, you still can't hear. Because the priest says it in a low voice. But not even the server standing at the altar can hear. You can hear a little whispering, you can't hear the words. But it matters what words I whisper at this book. It matters. Even the MC can't hear it. But it matters. Uno con Papa Nostro, Francisco. He really is the Pope. Does he have to be that holy? No. If he did, there would probably be five Popes. Only the ones that are canonized. The rest of them probably not be Popes. Doesn't have to be that holy. The Capello, he's cut off from the church. And then Leo XIII gives another explanation of the same thing. And he quotes St. Augustine. To explain very clearly how it is that you can have a true Mass in which Christ is present and it is displeasing to God and no grace flows from that Mass. If it does, you can go to it. If it doesn't, you can't. Just the other day I went to a place called, you may have heard of it, it's called Dairy Queen. <laughs> and I was in the Dairy Queen in Texas, of course, driving through Texas. I stopped at the Dairy Queen to get my uh, blizzard. <laughs> And it was open. And I walked into the Dairy Queen and they said, Our machines are broken. So why is the door open? The place is called Dairy Queen. You sell this fake ice cream stuff with stuff in it. Well, it's broken. So we don't have any Dairy Queen products available today, but we're still open. Well, if the machine's broken, it's broken. You can't get your blizzard. And then, it, and so that the, the here, if you're if you cut off from the church, it looks like the church, but it's not. Pope Leo XIII says in Exenia Nos Notitia, July 19, 1893, from the Petite Eglise, a, a schismatic church, which they said the Latin Mass. They said the Latin Mass. They didn't say that there was no new Mass. And the Petite Eglise, a small uh, schismatic church in France, he writes about that church. From this it follows. Also, that they cannot promise themselves any of the graces and fruits of the perpetual sacrifice. They cannot promise themselves any, any, not one drop, of the graces and fruits of the perpetual sacrifice and of the sacraments, which although they are sacrilegiously administered, are nonetheless valid and serve in some measure to form an appearance of piety, which St. Paul mentions, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and which St. Augustine speaks of at greater length. They get no fruits, but has the appearance of piety. There's a beautiful choir, there's a Latin mass, they're saying the prayers. And then he quotes St. Augustine, quote, The form of the branch, says St. Augustine with great precision, may still be visible, even apart from the vine. But the invisible life of the root can be preserved only in union with the stock. That is why the corporal sacraments which some keep and use outside the unity of Christ can preserve the appearance of piety. So it looks pious They're in these schismatic rites and the, uh, services. But the invisible and spiritual virtue of true piety 
cannot abide there any more than feeling can remain an amputated member. So a sermon of St. Augustine on the uh, Gospel of St. Matthew. But since they no longer have the, so that, but in any case, so there's no grace that flows from their sacraments. And here, so that uh, the, the, we have here, and this is assuming the new Mass, this is the reason why, this is the theological reason why we say the quote-unquote, I don't like the term, but it's still, you know, what they say, the quote-unquote red light position. Why do we tell you that you should not go to a, a systematic Mass? It's interesting that in our present crisis, they, 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 they say you can go to the Orthodox Mass, you can go to every Mass, you can go to the, to the adult Mass, you can go to the new Mass, you can go to the uh, Sede de Contest Mass, you can go to the uh, a, a normal priest Mass, you can go to any Mass you want except for the Mass of Boston, Kentucky. You cannot go to the Mass of the Resistance. All other Masses are open for business, according to Bishop Williamson and according to the many priests of the Resistance. And what are they saying now already? Some of our people are being refused uh, the sacraments. Already some of our faith have been refused confirmation. It's already happened in the last year. Already. And so the sacraments are being refused. Just like it was in 2012, being refused from the mainstream, now being refused from our own people. And it's interesting. We're the ones that say continuously, don't play games of the faith. Do not go to the new mass. Do not go to the society of St. the mainstream. Don't go to those who don't profess clearly the Catholic faith. But if you go, and you come back here, I'm not going to refuse your Holy Communion. I'm not going to condemn, because of the great crisis in the church. We must say clearly what is the truth, but the individuals have to see that truth for themselves by opening their minds and reading, reading what the Gospel says, following what the Fathers and the ancients have taught. So it is very serious that you cannot... They say that there's miracles in the new mass. You cannot say the new mass is doing good for souls. What is it doing? It is leading souls to no longer know their faith. And when they no longer know their faith, what's going to happen? They're going to abandon it. They're going to abandon it. We can't have that. We can't have that. And so there must be a firm profession of the faith. Notice what the Fev says concerning this, the new mass. We, may, we take an oath in the Society of Pius X that we are never going to recommend anyone to go to the new Mass. Bishop Williamson took that oath. All of us priests in the society took that oath. They will never make a recommendation for anyone to attend it. And yet many are making that recommendation now. And that's against an oath that we take. Why this oath? It is not a choice between two rites that could be good. This is a choice between a Catholic rite and a rite that is practically favoring Protestantism. You can't choose between a Catholic rite and a Protestant rite. Therefore, you cannot, in any circumstances, say that you can go to the new mass. It is a harm. It harms our faith. It harms the Catholic faith. The talk of verses of heaven, nineteen ninety, concerning why we make this oath. And then also, I'm a, I'm a little surprised. You know, sometimes I receive the verses of the Fed, a lot of requests for advice from our priests, since SSPX priests back in nineteen ninety, who are in the priories, and some ask me. What should one reply to a person who says he cannot have the Mass of St. Pius V, and who believes that he is under the obligation to go to a Mass of the New Rite, said by a good priest, a, a serious priest, who is holy, etc.? All the conditions mentioned by Bishop Williamson in his latest and comments, and also in this talk that he gave to the lady in Mayo Peck, New York. But I do not understand how they cannot answer this by themselves. They don't see the conclusion for themselves, and they feel obliged to ask me such a thing. It's incredible. <clears throat> so you see, there are still some who hesitate. This is unbelievable. How on earth can you even ask the question? Don't go to the new Mass. It's poison to the soul. It's poison. And then, of course, what about those that left us? And that, you will see, will be mandatory for some of those, for those who have left us, for the fraternity of St. Peter, for Dom Gerard, even if they, they never say the new Mass themselves, even if they have our own convictions, they will be obliged to consider the new rite with the same value as the traditional rite. And that's what we're after right now. The new rite is essentially the same. No, it's not. In practice, when they will receive priests, they'll have to say to them, yes, you can go ahead and say your new Mass. No problem. You can say your new Mass. And it's already happened in many cases, already by then, between 88 and 90. So, 
we have to follow the teaching of the church. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ, St. Paul told us, if an angel from heaven teaches you something different than what I have taught you, let him be anathema. Let him be anathema. We don't follow what is different. We follow what the, what the church has always taught. We don't mix with heretics. St. John the Almsgiver says, you keep fidelity of the flesh. You're worried about fidelity of the flesh. So that if a husband and wife are separated for a long time, there are laws and punishments that say you can't have adultery if it was separated for a long time. And if you keep fidelity of the flesh, what about the fidelity of the spirit? Fidelity of the spirit is infinitely more important. Therefore, I say to you, my children, never take communion with heretics or schismatics. Never do it. Never. Even if you can never take communion for the rest of your life. And so, we cannot communion with the enemies of God. And he also says in the same talk, Archbishop Lefebvre, some of the people have Mass only three times a year. That's the best we could do. But they are good Catholics there in the missions. They were good Catholics. We are not obliged to go to Mass every Sunday. There are many things that can, that can exempt us from the Mass every Sunday. Sickness and distance and so on. But we are obliged to keep our faith every minute of our lives. There could be no exceptions to that. We can never give up the faith. And if someone puts a gun to our head and says, you're not going to Mass today, we can skip out. It's okay. But if somebody puts a gun to your head and says, you must spit on a crucifix, somebody puts a gun to your head and says, you must believe that there are not three persons in God, you must accept the false religion of one form or another, or any error against our holy faith, we must die rather than make any question of that faith. And that's what we must do. There are many, many exceptions to Mass on Sunday, none to the faith. So let's persevere in the faith, and also let's say that given our present situation, everyone has to decide for themselves what they're going to do. It's a time of great crisis. But the fact is that unfortunately right now, Bishop Williamson is, this, is, is publicly professing another faith than the one given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. He publicly saying that there's good in the new Mass and the new church, and that it can benefit your souls, and that many souls have benefited from the new Mass and the new church. Bishop Thomas Aquinas, in his defense of Bishop Williamson, said, surely there are graces coming from the Novus Order of Holy Communion since Christ is there. But St. Pius and St. St. Thomas Aquinas says, no, no grace comes from the Holy Communion. In fact, those communions are all sacrilegious. And if a Catholic goes up to a heretic saying the true Mass, or goes up to a schismatic saying the true Mass and receives Holy Communion, it's a sacrilege and no grace is passed. Any grace that comes to those souls of the new Mass or those souls at Masses which are not in union with the true faith and true church, these graces are only ex opere operantis. They are not ex opere operatum. And to make it clear theologically, in question 64 of the Tertia Pars, in Article 9, St. Thomas Aquinas says, then in, 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 when heretics offer the true and correct form of the Mass, as well as schismatics or those excommunicated, there is a sacramentum tantum, but there is non res et sacramentum. Non res. So there is a sacramentum tantum, which means a sacrament only. Christ is validly present, but there is no grace, no res. The Latin word for the grace of the sacrament is a special word, res, which means a thing. In literal translation, but it's the whole res of the sacrament, the reality of the sacrament, the thing of the sacrament, the grace of the sacrament is not passed. Is not passed. Furthermore, they block it by their heresy. They block it by their schism. The only way in which grace flows into this world is by the grace coming from heaven through the church, through the holy sacrifice, the mass. And we can say that ordinary graces are being cut off, leading to the damnation of billions of souls. When the Society of St. Pius X theologically collapsed in 2012, it did not just hurt the SSPX. It hurt the whole world. It hurt the entirety of the Catholic Church. Graces are flowing from SSPX altars. And now those graces are being squeezed out. The infinite reservoir of grace is in heaven or in the well that the priest approaches when he comes to the altar. And each Mass, we reach down to that grace and pull out some of that grace and pour it on souls. And the grace is blocked. Christ is made present, but no grace flows. The only graces that do flow are the graces of the individual goodness of the priests, the individual goodness of the faithful. And these are very small trickles of graces. And they are the normal graces you can receive in any place. You don't need to go to a church to receive such graces. 
Therefore, a weakening of morality, a weakening of doctrine, a going away from the truth. The graces are not flowing. And the church wants to, the devil wants to stop all the flow of true graces. When we celebrate this holy sacrifice of the Mass in true union with the Pope, we are true servants of Pope Francis because we obey the laws he's supposed to put into practice. We obey the king he is a representative of. We have the faith that he is supposed to promote. And unfortunately, he's not doing so. There he will have to answer to God for that. But we must continue to be faithful servants. Like our sister Lefebvre in the 74 Declaration said, the only way to remain faithful, to remain faithful to the Pope, at that time Paul VI, the only way to remain faithful is to continue this fight for the Catholic tradition against all modernist errors and the heresies of Vatican II, period. And we pray for our superiors, the bishops of the dioceses and the popes, that they convert and come back to their true heritage, like the Arians had to do. The Arians taught false doctrine, and they were heretics, and therefore the faithful rightly rejected them and did not go to their masses, did not walk into their churches, did not pray with them. But when the Arian bishop converted and came back to the faith, the people went back into the church. The people went back into the church. They didn't replace the bishop. They didn't replace the bishop. And so it took a long time for the Arian crisis to end. We know by heaven this crisis will end quickly by the intervention of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's the only way it can end. But in between now and then, stand firm in the faith. They have not known the Father nor me, and hence they find themselves doing these evil things. We must know the Father. Listen to His teaching that comes down in sacred scripture and tradition. We must know the Son, which is that truth must enter into our minds and be a part of our 